My name is Bill Norsworthy. I'm the coordinator of today's presentation, and I'm a member of the Tampa Bay Coalition of Reason. This is the sponsoring group that has brought to the Southeast United States, to the state of Florida, to the Tampa Bay area, and to Clearwater, a true hero to the free thought movement, Richard Dawkins. The Coalition of Reason is comprised of seven local groups. Each meet uh, on a regular basis to discuss science and topical issues of the day, as well as philosophical ideas that are as old as civilization itself. So now, um, I would like to introduce to you the newly arrived minister of this congregation, the Unitarian Universalists of Clearwater. They are the hosts of today's presentation. Reverend Patrice Curtis, is now in her second month here with us. She has an undergraduate degree in anthropology and a master's in divinity from the Stark King School for the Ministry. She did postgraduate work at Oxford University. She studied the impact of civil conflict on refugees and displaced people. Before coming to ministry, she was a foreign affairs analyst, ran her own consulting firm, lived overseas in Europe and Africa, and sat on the boards of several nonprofits. We are very pleased and fortunate to have her as our minister here at UUC. Please welcome Reverend Patrice Curtis. Good afternoon. I am so pleased to have all of you here on the campus of the Unitarian Universalists of Clearwater. For those of you who don't know anything about Unitarian Universalism, I'll just say briefly that we are a faith that has at our core a relationship with each other, the promises we make to each other and the promises we make to help heal this broken world. We support each and every person on their own personal spiritual journey. We have beliefs within our congregations that range from those who have a relationship with a personal God to those who believe in many gods to those who believe in no God whatsoever. What is at the heart of our faith is being in loving relationship with each other. So I invite you, if this sounds intriguing, to come to our uh, Open Issues Sunday morning, which is at 9.30. That's our uh, intellectual discussion that we have. And then 10.30, we have worship right here in our sanctuary. And then stay for coffee hour at 11.30. Again, I am so pleased to have all of you with us. Welcome. Thank you, Reverend Curtis. And now it is my great pleasure to begin our program today by introducing the star of our Darwin Day celebration last February, Dr. Herb Silverman. Those of you who are here will remember his very humorous description of his run for governor of South Carolina as an atheist. His book about that campaign is titled Candidate Without a Prayer, after an eight-year legal battle, won a unanimous decision in South Carolina's Supreme Court, nullifying that state's religious test requirement to hold public office. Spoiler alert, he did not win that election. <laughs> he is a retired professor of mathematics at the University of Charleston, he is a very active person in the secular movement, as you can tell. He is a member of the Board of Directors of the American Humanist Association, and he's the founder of the Secular Coalition for America. Please welcome back to Clearwater our own dear friend, Dr. Herb Silverman. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Bill, for that wonderful introduction. It has become a cliche to introduce a speaker with, here's a speaker who needs no introduction. But today, 
that cliche is probably accurate. Richard Dawkins is the most cited scientist alive. He was voted the world's top thinker by Prospect Magazine, and he is the author of a dozen bestsellers covering science, culture, and religion. And it's my pleasure to introduce Richard Dawkins to you. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I've done things in Florida before and very much enjoy uh, coming here. Thank you, Herb, very much for that most gracious, too gracious, really. No. Um, <laughs> Told you he's immodest. Introduction. <laughs> he's mod um, overly modest. Uh, this book, Brief Candle in the Dark, is volume two of my autobiography. Uh, volume one is called An Appetite for Wonder and was published two years ago and covers my life, uh, ch childhood, school days, and so on, until I was 35 and published my first book, The Selfish Gene. Uh, the second volume, Brief Candle in the Dark, covers the, uh, the re remainder of my life so far, uh, and uh, so it's a, a roughly uh, divided in half. Originally, it was supposed to be a single volume autobiography. That was what the publishers contracted. When I got halfway through, I thought it would be a good idea to split it in half, and the publishers all agreed, all except the German publishers, who wanted one great big volume. <laughs> uh, but everybody else accepted uh, the, the two-volume two, the two format. And Brief Candle in the Dark is volume two, covers the age 35 to now. Uh, and unlike the first volume, which was written chronologically, this one is written thematically. So it doesn't follow chronologically. It's got themes like television, lectures, debates. Uh, books, that kind of thing. So, Herb, over to you. Thank you. You know, the title of your new book indirectly pays tribute to Carl Sagan's wonderful book, The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. As both a, a scientist and a science educator, I think of you as a spiritual heir to Carl Sagan, so to speak. Do you think of yourself that way? I would love to think of myself that way, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I have enormous admiration for Carl Sagan. I met him only once, uh, but he had exactly for me the right attitude towards the promotion of science. Uh, he didn't stress the usefulness of science, which many people do, and of course that's important. He stressed the wonder of science, the poetry of science. And that's what I aspire to do. I don't aspire to do it as well as he did, but I'm very grateful to follow in his footsteps. Uh, you know, the subtitle of your book, My Life in Science, can have three meanings. The book is about science, it's about your impact on science, and it's also about your life. Regarding your life, I love the story about meeting Lala Ward. <laughs> uh, would you read a, an er excerpt about that meeting? I Some think I can 1, find 149. it. Yes. <laughs> this was 1992, when Douglas Adams reached his 40th birthday, and his party was memorable for a particular reason. It was there that he introduced me to the actress Lala Ward, whom he had known from the days when Doctor Who was at its wittiest, because he was the script editor, and she and Tom Baker gave added value to the wit by their inventively ironic playing of the two leading roles. At the birthday party, Lala was talking to Stephen Fry when Douglas led me over and introduced us. Both Douglas and Stephen being absurdly taller than Lala and me, <laughs> it was natural that she and I should find ourselves facing each other under a gothic arch formed by Douglas and Stephen as they exchanged lofty witticisms high above us. <laughs> Through the archway, I shyly offered to refill Lala's glass. And when I returned, we rapidly reached agreement that the party was too noisy for conversation. I suppose by any faint chance it wouldn't just possibly be a good idea to go out and have a quick meal and, of course, return later. We discreetly slipped away and found an Afghan restaurant off the Marylebone Road. That Lala had read The Selfish Gene and watched my Christmas lectures was gratifying. 
that she had read the extended phenotype and Darwin, as well, was too good to be born. <laughs> I subsequently discovered that, in addition to Doctor Who's companion, she had played a beautiful Ophelia to Derek Jacobi's Hamlet in the BBC TV production, and was also a talented and versatile artist, published author, and book illustrator. As I said, too good to be born. We didn't return to the party. <laughs> I mentioned to Lala that I was about to embark on my American journey, having added to the itinerary a visit to John Brockman. She said she was about to set off for a holiday in Barbados with a girlfriend from the theatrical world. Impulsively, she asked if I would take her to America with me, although it would mean letting down her friend in Barbados. Equally impulsively, I agreed. Slight embarrassment then opened up. I was due to stay with Dan and Susan Dennett on first arriving in Boston, and later with the Brockmans in Connecticut. In both cases, one house guest was expected, not two. How could I broach the subject? Lala and I fretted that our hosts would ask, it is after all a perfectly normal question to ask of a couple, how long have you two known each other? <laughs> and we would have had to answer, a week. <laughs> As it turned out, they didn't ask, and it was only years later that Lala confessed to Dan the truth. Really, said Dan, with possibly mock innocence, I thought you'd known each other for years. <laughs> uh, thank you. What, what a wonderful love story. Uh, we're having a discussion here, not a debate, which is a good thing for Richard Dawkins, because in one sense, I'm a better debater. <laughs> and, hold on, here's why. If you debate a fundamentalist Christian, your opponent gets instant credibility for being on the same stage with Richard Dawkins. <laughs> Not so for someone who debates me. That's why I was happy to debate a well-known Christian apologist, William Lane Craig, who you refused to debate. He was so eager to shame you into debating him that he once appeared on a debate stage with an empty chair that represented you. <laughs> Frankly, I thought the empty chair won the debate. <laughs> So what do you think of that stunt and about debates between atheists and theists? The stunt has since become known as Eastwooding, hasn't it? Because, um, <laughs> yes. But, but, but um, he, had it, he had it first. Um, he is uh, not somebody that I, I have, in fact, debated him, although he doesn't acknowledge that just when, when he's trying to persuade people that I won't. Uh, I did have a debate with him in Mexico. He was not a good performer. Um, he, there were three people on his side and three pe people on mine. He was the least impressive debater on his side. Um, he has a pompous and pedantic style, uh, wh which is based upon sort of elementary logic. Premise one, axiom one, deduction mm -hmm. two, that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But the main reason why I won't debate him now is his outrageous apology for the biblical slaughter of the Canaanites. <coughs> Uh, now, no, no biblical scholar actually thinks that this really happened, but he thinks it happened, and he defends it on the grounds that the Canaanites were sinners and deserved what was coming to them, and even more insidiously, that they were occupying land that God had promised to the Israelites, or Israelis, as he calls them. He gets even worse when he asks the question, but what about the children? What about the Canaanite children? And he says, well, that's all right, because they're all going to heaven anyway. Can you see why I won't, be, I won't share a platform with this man? OK, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> well, you gave a great answer regardless. But you know, what, in general, uh, do you think about debates between atheists and okay. theists? Um, I don't do debates with creationists for a different reason, um, which is that uh, having two chairs on the stage gives the illusion that there's something to debate. Mm -hmm. I have never actually dared use... Mm -hmm. I've never actually dared use the 
reply of my colleague Robert May, a very distinguished Australian scientist now living in Britain, uh, and the government chief scientific advisor in his time and president of the Royal Society. When he was asked to have a debate with a creationist, he said, you have to pardon my attempt at an Australian accent, that would look great on your CV, not so good on mine. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't do debates with, with, with creationists. I'm very happy to have a civilized conversation with anyone, um, and I've had many civilized conversations with bishops and archbishops and chief rabbis and, and cardinals and people like that. You know, now, I think there's actually a split in the atheist community on this, and I agree that Richard Dawkins uh, shouldn't have uh, creationists on his CV, but living in a place like South Carolina where there were so many creationists and they hear about atheists only from their ministers, I think it's a good idea to hear about atheism from atheists. And there are so many more of them than there are of us uh, that I think it's good to engage with them so they hear other points of view. Yeah. In, in, in uh, 1979, you were on a sabbatical leave here in Florida, studying wasps, the insect, not the white Anglo-Saxon <laughs> Protestants. <laughs> but, but you also learn ways that Florida is different from Great Britain. How about reading about that experience? I did a sabbatical leave at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Uh, with my colleague, Dr. Jane Brockman, who had just left Oxford, where we'd been working together. We'd been working together with a graduate student of mine, Alan Graffin, who has since become what I would call a mentor of mine. He's a brilliant mathematical biologist, and I've learned far more from him, though he was my student, than he ever learned from me. Jane and I conducted a graduate seminar in evolution and behavior at Gainesville, in which we were joined by two other professors. My chief memory of these weekly gatherings was the way in which they became increasingly dominated by the intellectual power of Alan Graffin. On the face of it, he was just a graduate student among many, and one of the youngest. But it was remarkable how we all, students and professors alike, fell into the habit of turning to Alan to resolve our difficulties and tell us, in his sharp Scottish tones, how to think clearly about them and reach the correct conclusion. My Florida sabbatical wasn't all wasps and work. Jane, Alan, and I were joined by Donna Gillis, a friend of Jane's from the zoology department, and the four of us set off to discover more of Florida. We went on drives to Disney World. Alan insisted on taking all the most hair-raising rides. And Sea World, Alan was the first to volunteer to be pushed into the pool by a performing seal. <laughs> We went to the university's Seahorse Key, marine biology research station on the Gulf of Mexico coast, where we self-catered and slept in dormitory bunks. We saw Limulus horseshoe crabs, although they aren't crabs at all, but distant relatives of spiders. Jane later did research on these living fossils. We saw thousands of ghost crabs, they really are crabs, scuttling into their burrows as we approached, leaving their easily traced footprints. Most memorable was the phosphorescence in the sea caused by the disturbance of microscopic organisms in the plankton. We played ducks and drakes, skimming flat stones over the water and watching the glowing ripples as the stones struck the surface. Donna danced on the night beach, her toes in the wet sand inscribing patterns of glowing and then fading phosphorescent blue, charmingly singing of herself in the third person. She's dancing. On another beach, Alan and I swam naked, which alarmed Jane and Donna, because to Alan's and my surprise, apparently it was and is illegal, even at night. <laughs> now that I think about it, an incident many years later gives me reason to believe the illegality really is taken seriously in the United States. The anthropologist Helen Fisher and I were skinny dipping in Lake Michigan one warm summer night after a hot day of conference speeches at Northwestern University. A police car drew up on the road 100 yards away. It was dark, so I don't know how they had spotted us, but they trained a searchlight on us <laughs> and bellowed through a bullhorn, you're subject to arrest, you're subject to arrest, you're subject to arrest. 
panic-stricken, without waiting to get dry, Helen and I tugged our clothes on as we ran. <laughs> no such incident marred Alan's and my rather swift and brief dip in the moonlit Florida waves. I suspect with hindsight that we did it for reasons of bravado more than enjoyment. Jane now tells me she discourages her students from swimming off that particular beach because one often sees sharks there. <laughs> That, that reminds me, if I may, of a, of a story in volume one of my, of a, yeah, an, an appetite for wonder, I think it is. Um, there's a lake in Northern Ireland where our family go to stay sometimes, and uh, the, the, the children are in the habit of swimming naked there. And one time, somebody shouted, there's a pike. You know, a pike is a large predatory fish. I don't know whether you have them there. And then all the boys, but not the girls, went hurtling into <laughs> in, <laughs> And fortunately for you, uh, Richard, in 1979, there was no YouTube to have filmed that. <laughs> now, you've met and written about so many famous and accomplished people like Neil Armstrong, Bill Gates, David Attenborough, Richard Leakey, John Cleese, James Watson, Francis Crick, Karl Popper, and many more. The only one in your book who stood you up was the Dalai Lama. Yes. Who else would you like to meet, and why did the Dalai Lama stand you up? <laughs> well, um, this was a television program called Sex, Death, and the Meaning of Life, and it was for Channel 4, and the producer wanted me to go and interview the Dalai Lama, and so she phoned up and said, would I go to India to interview the Dalai Lama? And I said, he won't see me, don't you? There's no, not a chance. Um, of course he won't see me. But I tell you what, if you can get him, if you can persuade him, then I'll do it. Ha, ha, ha. I mean, I, that was my way of saying no, because I knew, I knew he wouldn't agree. So she said, right, and she went off. And then about three weeks later, the telephone rang, and she said in great excitement, he's agreed, he's agreed, he's agreed. We're going to, the, we're going to India, we're going to India. The Dalai Lama's agreed, we're going to interview the Dalai Lama. So I said, oh, well, all right. Um, <laughs> I promised, so I guess I'll have to go. Um, and we went to India, and as I thought, he was much too busy uh, to see me. Um, and so we interviewed his, I don't know, chief lieutenant or, or lieutenant, sorry. Um, uh, and we had a good time in India. We did all sorts of fascinating things and lots of, got some very good footage. But that was the time he stood me up, yes. Uh, are there other people that you would like to meet that you haven't yet met? I like to meet all sorts of people. I mean, I'd like to meet... <laughs> Besides um, the people here, of course. Uh, yes, of course. Um, I'd like to meet uh, President Obama, who I believe is the first atheist president of the United States. <laughs> I disagree with you, actually. I don't think President Obama is the first atheist. I think we've had several, yeah. Like, yeah. like Jack Kennedy yeah. and uh, uh, many Clinton. other bright presidents. Yeah. But I'm hoping to ha someday have an out-of-the-closet, an openly secular uh, president yeah. in this country. Yeah. <laughs> now, atheists are sometimes put in the uncomfortable position of being asked, to say grace before a meal. I know this happened to you at Oxford. Do you want to tell us about yeah. it? Okay. It's, it's on, um, if you want. It's okay. On it also minutes. happened to me one time after I'd had a debate at Wellington College, and the headmaster put me on the spot by asking me to say a secular grace. So <laughs> I didn't have much time, so I said, for what we are about to receive, thank the cook. <laughs> <laughs> In, in, incidentally, <laughs> that, that grace uh, makes sense to me, but I also like the grace by a cartoon character, Bart Simpson. He said, dear God, we paid for this food. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking of uh, the Simpsons, uh, there was a terrific experience for me, uh, when Richard spoke at the College of Charleston in 2013, 
The day after, we had a little reception for him at our place. And during the reception, Richard said, uh, do you mind if we watch some TV? Now, it seemed like an odd request, but then I put on the TV, and we turned to The Simpsons, and Richard was on. He was a star <laughs> of The Simpsons. <laughs> okay, this is the, the, the story you want me to read here. As sub-warden of New College, the sub-warden is just the, it's, it's a rotating position that everybody has to do at some point. As sub-warden, I had to preside over dinner in hall and say grace before Benedictus Benedicat and after Benedicto Benedicata. I was one of the majority who pronounced this last word, Benedicata. Some of the older classically trained fellows pronounced it Benedicator, which fascinated me, although I never dared follow them. I doubt that they really thought that's how the Romans pronounced it, but their justification was surely thought out and deliberate, probably buried in some erstwhile dispute among the dominies. One of my predecessors as sub-warden, the ancient historian Geoffrey de St. Croix, used to refuse to say grace on conscientious grounds. He described himself as an atheist, politely militant. Equally conscientiously, however, he went out of his way to line somebody up to say it for him. Once when I was a dinner guest at King's, our sister college at Cambridge, whose chapel, incidentally, is one of the most beautiful buildings in England, the senior fellow presiding was the incomparable Sidney Brenner, one of the founding fathers of molecular genetics and winner of a well-deserved, they aren't always, Nobel Prize. Sidney gaveled everybody to stand, then solemnly intoned to his neighbor, Dr. So-and-so, will you please say grace? I, however, was of the school of thought of the great philosopher Sir Alfred Eyre, who, when sub-warden of New College, cheerfully said grace on the grounds that, I will not out of falsehoods, but I have no objection to making meaningless statements. <laughs> Geoffrey de St. Croix, by the way, who I just mentioned, uh, his lifelong quest was to, to decide whether Plato or St. Paul was the greatest shit of all time. <laughs> Uh, Richard, among your many television appearances in England was the series of programs you had on enemies of reason about things like astrology, homeopathy, dowsing, and other superstitious nonsense, excluding religion. Well, the headquarters of Scientology is right here in, in Clearwater. <laughs> in addition to being superstitious nonsense, there's a controversy about whether it's even a religion. Do you think Scientology is a religion, and does it matter? The thing that's it, that um, picks it out from the others is that it's recent, and therefore we can see the nonsense that it's based upon, whereas the, the older religions, they have the kind of sanctity of, of time that sort of hallowed them. But actually, they're probably in their... probably give. Scientology another 2,000 years, and, it, and it'll, it'll seem no worse than any of the others. But it does seem to have a very sinister aspect. They, it does seem that they use coercion and threats. Uh, once you're captured by them, it seems to be very hard to escape. Uh, and they seem to have an awful lot of money, which is ill-gotten and tax-free, which, of course, it should not be. Uh, but um, yes, I mean, I, th I think it is a force for evil. But are there any religions that you would say otherwise? Well, I think that uh, Unitarianism. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think they're all as bad as each other. I mean, I think, I think they, there's a pecking order of awfulness. <laughs> you, you know, you know when, when I first declared for governor, I was hoping to get invitations, and I got an invitation to the Unitarian Church in Charleston. And I mentioned that to somebody who said, well, big deal, that's not a real church. <laughs> and they meant it as a compliment. <laughs> uh, but you know, I guess, you know, I don't know how people here in Clearwater feel, but in a sense, I like when you have specifically wacky religions, because then when I talk to, say, uh, Christians who say, they're really crazy. I say, yeah, I agree with what you say about that and other religions, but can you see how some of us outsiders think that yours is equally crazy? So I like diversity in crazy religions rather than a monopoly. <laughs> also, you know, in that part about enemies of reason, 
uh, you talk about an interesting uh, double-blind study on kinesiology, which you participated in. Uh, would you uh, read an excerpt about that? You know the, the, the double-blind trial technique. It's, it's designed to protect the scientist against his own bias or her own bias. Um, with the best will in the world, a scientist cannot help uh, sometimes making readings which are a little bit biased, maybe even against your own hypothesis if you're really, really conscientious. So the double-blind trials, used especially in medical trials, where neither the patient nor the doctor nor the nurse who administers the, the dose knows whether it's the control pill that's being given or whatever it is, and the experimental. Nobody is allowed to know. It's, the, the information is locked up in a computer somewhere and only unmasked when the trial is finished. And then the st statistics are done. I don't know who invented the double-blind trial, but it is a brilliantly effective yet simple technique. There's a telling story in John Diamond's courageous book, Snake Oil, written when he was dying of cancer and beset by well-meaning quacks. The skeptical investigator Ray Hyman once did a double-blind trial of an alternative diagnostic technique called applied kinesiology. As it happens, I have experienced kinesiology myself. I'd ripped my neck and was in pain. It was the weekend and I couldn't go to my normal doctor. So I decided to be open-minded and try an alternative practitioner. Before beginning her manipulation, she did a diagnostic test which consisted of pushing against my arm to test my strength while I was lying on my back, kinesiology. She demonstrated to her own satisfaction that my arm was stronger when I had a small vial of vitamin C resting on my chest. The vial was sealed. There was no way for the vitamin to enter my body, so it was obvious that she was really, though probably subconsciously, pressing harder against my arm when the vial was not there than when it does, when it was. When I expressed my skepticism, she gushed her enthusiasm. Yes, C is a marvelous vitamin, isn't it? <laughs> Self-deception of that kind is precisely what the double-blind technique was invented to eliminate. In testing the efficacy of any medicine, not only must it be compared with a placebo control, it is vitally important that neither the patient nor the experimenter, nor the nurse administering the dose should know which is experimental, which control. Ray Hyman did a double-blind trial of a slightly less far-fetched claim of kinesiology than used by my quack, that a drop of fructose placed on the tongue would strengthen a patient's arm when compared with a drop of glucose. Under double-blind conditions, there was no difference in strength, whereat the chief kinesiologist delivered himself of this immortally indignant remark. You see, that's why we never do double-blind testing anymore. <laughs> it never works. <laughs> Which is one of the best proofs that double-blind does work. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I know that there's a book with a clever title called The God Gene. And it argues that our genes may predispose humans towards spiritual or mystical experiences. You've coined a lot of words, but probably the best known is meme. And you even mentioned the God meme in your book. How about reading that passage? It is true that cultural evolution is orders of magnitude faster than genetic evolution. But I would have been jumping the gun if I'd implied that natural selection of memes, the meme is the, is the cultural unit of selection by analogy with the gene, which is the biological unit of selection. It's a unit of imitation, you could call it that. But I would have been jumping the gun if I'd implied that natural selection of memes should take all credit for cultural evolution. It might, but that would have been a bolder claim than I set out to make. The evolution of language, for example, clearly owes more to drift mimetic drift, than to anything resembling selection. I went on to coin the word itself. The new soup, by analogy with the primeval soup in which life began, the new soup is the soup of human culture. We need a name for the new replicator, a noun that conveys the idea of a unit of cultural transmission or a unit of imitation. My meme, 
comes from a suitable Greek root, but I want a monosyllable that sounds a bit like gene. I hope my classicist friends will forgive me if I abbreviate my meme to meme. This is all from the selfish gene, by the way. If it is any consolation, it could alternatively be thought of as being related to memory, or to the French word, mem. It should be pronounced to rhyme with cream. Just as genes are selected for their mutual compatibility, so, in principle, might memes be. The large literature on memetics, this is all, of course, now since the selfish gene, the large literature on memetics has adopted the word memeplex as a contraction of meme complex. In the selfish gene, I reiterated the idea of cooperating gene complexes. I used the phrase evolutionarily stable set of genes, and then tentatively drew the memetic parallel as follows. Again, a quote from the selfish gene. Mutually suitable teeth, claws, guts, and sense organs evolved in carnivore gene pools, while a different stable set of characteristics emerged from herbivore gene pools. Does anything analogous occur in meme pools? Has the god meme, say, become associated with any other particular memes? And does this association assist the survival of each of the participating memes? Perhaps we could regard an organized church with its architecture, rituals, laws, music, art, and written tradition as a co-adapted, stable set of mutually assisting memes. Thank you. I, I, I see our time is just about up uh, before we take questions from the audience, but I want to have one more important question to ask. My, my wife, Sharon, gets frustrated uh, living in the Bible Belt of South Carolina and often suggests we move to a, a more civilized place like Vermont or California. I prefer staying in South Carolina because that's where we can make more of a difference. Now, Richard, you live in a civilized country where, <laughs> where no politician would ever think of ending a speech with, God bless England. You can do a lot more good here. So would you consider moving to the United States? <laughs> Well, I, I like to spend a, a lot of time in this country. And we I do, like that you do. I do spend time in this country, particularly perhaps in the service of my foundation, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, uh, which does have a branch in Britain, but has a much more active branch, a much more flourishing branch in America. Um, and uh, we just had a reception before this, this meeting, for example, here. The... The foundation in America does a number of things. It raises money to do these things, and it has a membership uh, to help. And so anybody who wishes to be a member, uh, please do. The kind of things we are doing are, well, firstly, the Openly Secular campaign, which is a campaign to raise consciousness of the number of non-religious people that there are in America. It's widely believed that this country is an exceedingly religious country, Maybe it is, but I suspect it's exaggerated. And I suspect that there may be a certain emperor's new clothes effect. And that it may be that if enough people who actually are not religious actually stand up and say they're not religious, that there will be a tipping point, And suddenly, the dam will burst. And it will become apparent that actually, America is not much more religious than Western Europe, where uh, religion is dying, all except for Islam. Um, so openly secular, we're doing um, YouTube videos. We're getting ordinary people, nice people, your neighbors, your friends, people that you know and like, to, to do a, a very short YouTube video saying, I'm a teacher, I'm a fireman, I'm a policeman, uh, I'm a nurse, I'm a farmer, and I'm openly secular. Also celebrities, uh, and celebrities for some reason I've never understood, but advertising people know, uh, people tend to imitate celebrities. So we're getting celebrities as well. So the Openly Secular campaign is uh, a, a, a well-organized, um, rather sophisticated campaign being professionally run. Um, so look out for that. Um, we're also uh, mindful of the fact that middle school in America is not serving the teaching of evolution well. 
This is partly because many middle school science teachers are actually not um, trained in science and are especially reluctant to teach evolution because they get pushback, because they get threats, they get um, protests from children or from their parents. And they don't feel confident enough of the subject matter to withstand the sort of criticism and attacks that they get. We have a, a wonderful teacher actually from, from Florida, Bertha Vasquez, uh, from Miami. And she is coordinating the Ties campaign. So Bertha is coordinating middle school teachers and helping them, giving them teaching materials, advising them on how to teach evolution. And I, that is particularly close to my heart, that, that part of the, of the program. We're also sponsoring, because this is the 90th anniversary of the famous monkey trial in Tennessee, the Scopes trial. Next year is the, is the 90th anniversary. And so we're sponsoring 90 school productions of the play Inherit the Wind. M many of you may have seen the magnificent film of Inherit the Wind with Spencer Tracy. Um, so we're, we're paying for the rights of, for 90 schools in America to put on this play, which we hope will have um, educational effect. And we're also uh, trying to get Hollywood to uh, put atheist characters into soap operas and sitcoms and uh, put, put them in as nice, decent, amusing, friendly characters, not sort of sinister characters. Um, so that, that's the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, and it, it has a membership. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, Richard. Even though you're not ready to move to the United States. I move here, I move here two or three times a year. <laughs> I, I become a, a voting citizen. Uh, but we really thank you for the act of Richard Dawkins Foundation that you and Robin Blumner, uh, CEO of the foundation, are doing in our nation's capital. And now we'll be taking questions. Good afternoon, Professor Dawkins. I can't believe I used to think you were evil. Uh, <laughs> but my question is, how much of your secular activism is motivated by the uh, irreparable damage that creationism does in cutting off so many millions of people from, from uh, experiencing the wonder of nature, from understanding themselves in so much more? Yes, a, a, very substantial, a, a very substantial amount. Um, I, am, uh, I, I regard evolution as not just the truth, but as wonderful and as poetic and as enthralling and exciting. And uh, the, the fact that we, living in this century as we do, living ever since Darwin, have been in a position to answer the, a child's question, where do I come from? What's life all about? What's it for? Why is life here? Why is it so diverse? We can answer that. And it's an incredibly exciting field to look at. And I think it's little short of a tragedy that children are being brought up with a silly lie uh, about what this is all about. And so for me, it's a driving passion. Uh, and that is, I suppose, my main motivation. I am also, of course, motivated by the uh, bad things that are done in the name of religion. Um, and in, in this, I have to say, not all religions are as, as bad as each other, as I said, as I said earlier. But I, I, I am passionate at the, the sheer wickedness which is perpetrated in the name of religion by people who don't know they're being wicked. They think they're being righteous. They think they're doing the will of their God because that's what they've been taught in their schools. And what you're taught in early childhood is sometimes rather hard to, to shake off. So I believe that the 9-11 hijackers, for example, probably thought they were very good people. They probably thought they were doing the right, righteous thing. And that's what religion can do. As Steven Weinberg said, you will have good people doing good things and bad people doing bad things. But for good people to do bad things, that takes religion. Hi, Professor Dawkins. I teach uh, science in an informal facility here in Florida and have done an evolution activity that did get a lot of pushback from the public. Um, but I wanted to ask you if you could 
kind of summarize one meme you think should be implanted in the minds of children to help them um, pursue science and be inspired and uh, follow a path of reason, what do you think that would be? Well, I'm, I'm interested to hear that you get, you get pushback. I'm sorry to hear that, uh, but I'm not surprised. Um, I, I think probably evolution is as, good a, is as good a test case as any, because that's the one where we absolutely know it's true. There's no doubt about it. And the evidence is so overwhelming. And you should be able to present the evidence as overwhelming. Um, uh, there's just such a lot of it. But one time when I was here in Florida, I heard a story from a teacher in Miami who said that um, she had been reported uh, by one of the children in her class to its parents for teaching evolution. The parent went and then complained to the head teacher and forbade this science teacher from teaching the very foundation of her subject, namely evolution. And uh, she, the, the, this teacher, fortunately, was full of initiative. She had been forbidden to teach evolution, so she went to the nearest university and got a, a professor of biology to come to her class, and he taught evolution. <laughs> My understanding of evolution is that as we cast off things that we no longer need as we evolve, that those genes stay with us. They're just turned off by some sort of enzyme or something. Is that true? And if that's the case, is, would that not be the best argument against creationism and idiotic It's a very design? good argument. It's not necessarily the best, but it, it is a very powerful argument. Um, there, it, it's very true that sometimes genes are simply turned off. For example, um, we as humans don't have a very good sense of smell compared with other mammals, like dogs, rhinoceroses. But the genes for being good at smelling are still there. They're just turned off. So they're called pseudogenes. They're vestigial, they're vestigial genes. They're relic genes. Um, it's a bit like when you use, when you're, use your computer and you're doing lots of editing work and writing letters and things, um, and, and you think that your hard disk is just a nice tidy thing with this document and that document and that document which you know you're working on. What you don't realize is that the hard disk is littered with defunct, extinct versions of things that you've been working on. They're still there. They're not deleted. All that's happened is that the pointer to them has been removed. So they're no longer accessible to the system. But, that, but they, they are still there. And if you examine the disk at the machine code level, you find all sorts of fragments and relics of past work. And that's sort of what the genome is like. The genome is littered with outdated relics and fragments of old genes. Uh, and that is indeed a very powerful argument in, in favor of evolution. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Professor Dawkins, I was wondering what your thoughts are on why it appears as though humans tend to be drawn to the supernatural and or religion. Well, that could be a psychological question. It, you could be asking, what is it in human psychology that draws people to this? And a psychologist might answer something like, oh, fear of death or um, a hangover into adulthood of the imaginary friend phenomenon which so many children have. Um, as an evolutionist, I give a slightly different kind of answer and ask the question, what is it about such psychological predispositions which uh, has been favored by natural selection? Uh, predispositions to being religious. And I can imagine not a survival value of being re religious per se, but a survival value of certain psychological predispositions which manifest themselves as religion under the right cultural or educational conditions. Things like being subservient to authority. So I could easily imagine that a child brain might be naturally selected to obey authority, to believe your parents when they tell you things, because your parents have the wisdom that you need to survive in a, in a hostile world on the African plains, and, and you as a child don't. So natural selection could favor a tendency in the child brain to be 
obedient to parents and to believe parents. And that would automatically make the brain vulnerable if the, if the parents tell the child things that are not good advice, but nonsense, like um, re religion. <laughs> okay, thank you all for participating. Let's thank Richard.